Good morning, Oak Road. We are back doing our weekly lessons. I know it's been a lapse for a while for many different reasons, but we're glad to be back. We're glad to be back in God's Word together as your four ministers. Please continue to pray for us and our church. And a lot, there's a lot going on, as you know, with opening up on Wednesday nights for prayer service outside and also for our Sunday morning services since September. So please continue to pray for us, pray for our country and our leaders and um, that we make it through all of this. And pray for the members of our church, especially those that are, um, are hurting right now for many different reasons, are in the hospital, recovering from surgeries. Please continue to pray. The lesson today talks about um, discipleship and the cost of that discipleship. And the biggest cost, or the, the one word that describes it the most, I think, is commitment. There's a huge piece in here about commitment, commitment to Christ when we become his disciple and the changes that will take place in our lives as we, um, as we go to him, as we become his disciples. And discipleship is an ongoing thing. It's not a one-time hey, you're my disciple and now everything's okay or you know everything. That does not happen. We continually learn more about Jesus and ourselves and it's just an ongoing process. We have several scriptures today in Luke. Um, I'm going to pray first and we're going to read these scriptures and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here once again together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your lessons. And dear Lord, we thank you that of all of those you have chosen to be your disciples. Dear Lord, we just pray that all of us are committed to you 100%. And dear Lord, we know that um, you teach us each and every day. And we know that as we get into your word, we learn something new every day. So please continue to be with us. Help us as we learn more about you and be with this lesson today. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I'm going to read the first set of verses, and then you guys can um, read the sec second and third set. This is Luke 9, starting in verse 57 to 62. And the section in my Bible says, The cost of following Jesus. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those that have my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So can somebody read Luke 14, um, 25 and 27? I will. Luke 14, 25 through 27. It says, Now great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, Yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And Luke fourteen twenty-eight through thirty-five. Got it. For which of you, wanting to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him, saying, This man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king, going to war against another king, will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Now salt is good, but if salt should lose its taste, how will it be made salty? It isn't fit for the soil or for the manure pile. 
they throw it out. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen. Like I said in the beginning, this is all about commitment. And that is what Jesus is asking for when he asks somebody to be their disciple. He wants their commitment. So we need to talk a little bit about commitment, what commitment is, and um, how we can be committed to him. I think one of the pitfalls uh, of all of this, I mean, when we read this, this is shocking to, to hear Jesus use words like hate. Um, and I think we need to remember that that word hate is, is hyperbolic. Um, what he's telling us is that uh, because the, the 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 greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he's saying that he should be the priority to such a degree that, in relative terms, loving our neighbors, i.e., our family as well as ourselves, should be such a distant second that it resembles hate. Uh, you know, people will use these these scriptures to say, "Oh, there's contradictions in the Bible." Fifth commandment says, honor your mother and father. How can you honor your mother and father and hate your mother and father? That's not what Jesus is saying. It's metaphorical. Um, but it's shocking. And to be quite honest, when I was saved, I was told, Jesus made a commitment to you. Jesus died for you. Jesus was committed. But I was never told, you got to be committed to Jesus. I, I was never told, hey, you got to give up some things, if not everything, to follow Jesus. I was told about all the good stuff that I was getting. And I would think, well, why wouldn't I want to be a disciple? Why wouldn't I want to follow Jesus? I'm not going to go to hell anymore. Great, that's wonderful. You know, my, my default destination is no longer my default destination. God has intervened, and I'm not going to go to hell. I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. Oh, man, I have peace and joy and hope that nothing can take away. But who wouldn't want that? I mean, if you had common sense, in my opinion. That word hate, I hate the word hate. Um, when somebody uses that word, that strong word. I mean, it's a, it's one of those four-letter words. And, um, and I looked up the word hate in this context, and what I found was, be, because when you read this, it's like hate. What a strong word! But I, I found to put in a lower position than something else. In other words, it's not a love-hate relationship. It's love less. Right. I love less. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. So it, it's not... I mean, you can love something this much, but if you love it this much, you hate it. You know, it, it's just a different level. Mm -hmm. So when I found that definition, it made me feel a little better about these these words in here. But like I said, I, I just don't like the word hate. I, I don't like using it. I don't like it's a strong it. word. Yes. So in that section of scripture, verses 25 through 27 of chapter 14, the, uh, what, is, what's, what is happening here is he's reminding us of the priority of God and his son in our own lives. So, uh, so when asked what the most important commandment is, Jesus said that the second most important commandment is to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And of course, that's in Matthew 22. But the first commandment is to love the Lord our God with all that we are. So again, it goes back goes back to that commitment, goes back to the priority to God, right. and love God first, yes. above all else. First well, Timothy five eight says that as we care for our loved ones, we demonstrate our faith. So obviously, there's no contradiction. Uh, Jesus is talking about prioritizing our lives. Yes. And uh, the the first couple of guys that, that he talks to in uh, chapter nine, the the crowd. Um, Jesus does not pull any punches and, and this is the thing that you, you have to love about Jesus and at the same time it has to make you uncomfortable because he does not mince words when it comes to the kingdom of God we live in a society that loves shades of gray doesn't like objective truth doesn't like the authority of the Bible uh, Jesus does not give us that option. Being a disciple, there are hard edges to that. And this first guy, uh, he, he, he's concerned about his comfort. He's like, you know, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus knows his heart. And, and he says, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man 
has nowhere to lay his head. If you want to follow me, you're going to have to live like me. And I think it's amazing that the creator of the universe was homeless in his own creation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet we as create as creatures, we want these creature comforts. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jesus knew that. He's <laughs> showing us that comfort is is nothing. You know, we have to be willing to follow him to the point of discomfort and beyond that. Humility. Going with what Trey was saying in Matthew ten thirty seven, whoever loves father or mother more than me, this is Jesus speaking, is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Yeah. Um, then it goes on, and whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Stay right there, Richard. Okay. I think I think uh, Matthew ten twenty five says. I have not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. Uh, and and is that what that says? Is that the is that the correct address for that? Ten twenty five. Twenty five is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant of his master. If you have called a master of the house, um, how much more would you malign those? And maybe it's thirty five, but that's what he says in there. I, I you know don't be confused. I've not come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword, and and this sword of division is what Jesus is talking about here because he's saying that essentially the same thing there is that our love, our hearts can't be divided uh, when it comes to the primacy and the preeminence of Christ. Jesus demands. He, he's, you know, when, as we've been going through the study of Revelation, I've been talking about the gentleness and meekness of a lamb. And then this past week in, in Revelation 6, we're talking about the wrath of the lamb. That just doesn't sound you know, like common sense to us. Mm -hmm. We don't think of lambs as being wrathful. Uh, and, and that's what Jesus is telling us here. It's one of those contradictory things. He doesn't want part of our heart. He demands all of our heart. He demands to have preeminence in our lives, and that's what he deserves. He doesn't want us to be divided. Uh, and so when he says, I, I haven't come to bring peace, I've come to bring a sword, anything that competes with him, he wants it gone. He wants it cut out. I did find that verse 34. 34, okay. And um, it says, I know it was Matthew 10 somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. And then a notation for those verses uh, says, um, To Jew Jews, loyalty to a family and loyalty to Christ disqualifies a person from being one of his disciples um, over Christ. I'm sorry. Right. Um, and they often face when somebody goes and starts following Jesus, they often face division and conflict, even in their own families, and that is so true. That is right. Absolutely. Especially in their own families. Right. You know, because those are the people that are closest to you. And they're the people that you don't want to hurt. <laughs> and, and back to the first set of verses um, in 59, or in 60, it says, but he told him, but the dead bury, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Um, when th this person wanted to go bury his father, I read one of the commentaries was that he might not have even died yet. He waited on his he, inheritance. He and, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. he, he wanted to make sure he got his share of things, I guess mm -hmm. you'd say. So, you know, that could have been 10 years later, 20 mm -hmm. years later, you know. For, no. So, so basically, then the the first verse, fifty seven, talked about as Jim mentioned a while ago, the comfort. Uh, then you just mentioned the the wealth, which also includes duty. You know, saying, "Well, I have to do this as my father," type thing. And then in verse sixty one, then we're talking about family as well, because Jesus told the third person that following him means no turning back, uh, not even saying goodbye to loved ones. And so, uh, I think through these three examples that were given, that was said here. The, uh, you know, there's a moment when every believer made a clear verbal commitment of basically saying, you know, I have decided to follow Jesus in one way or another. And so when we look at our experience that we had ourselves, we all had to leave something behind. If we were going to take our, our commitment to Christ seriously, we had to leave something behind to move forward. And so and Jesus just reminds his disciples that following him it's not just something they can say, but it thing, includes things they must do as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, in lessons, above all else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
the, this first section that we're talking about, 57 through 62, it's about security and comfort. That's what all this boils down to. Mm -hmm. um, the, the guy wants to go back and say goodbye to his family. When you say yes to Jesus and you follow it up with a but, then you're not saying yes to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Jesus even said, nobody puts his hand to the plow and looks back, it's for the kingdom of God. So when you say yes to Jesus, you tear the rearview mirror off mm -hmm. and you keep moving forward in him. Uh, in Luke 8, 14, Jesus tells a parable of the sower. And he said that some of the seed fell among the thorns and it choked. they were choked with worries of riches and pleasures of life and produced no mature fruit. So... This is, this is typical to the human condition, that we want safety and security. We let, we let the things of life worry us to the point that we become ineffective for the kingdom of God, sure. where we, we are Christian light, mm -hmm. where we're not really dedicated to Jesus. You know, we, we read the Bible occasionally. We really don't pray, but we tell people we'll pray for them. Um, and, and that... Right. That's hypocrisy. Discipleship becomes an afterthought, almost. Discipleship is to be a way of life. It's to be a way of life. Um, I have friends who are Marines. And one thing that I will say that the, the Marines, uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful people in the Marines, they, they start indoctrinating Marines, or I should say recruits, because they're not Marines until they pass. Correct. But they begin indoctrinating them immediately that you are no longer yourself, you are part of a team. It's the man on your right and your left that you're responsible for. Mm -hmm. And they become just an inseparable thing where you know you are no longer yourself, but you are a Marine. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a wonderful mindset. And I wish people would apply that more to their Christian life. That you, know, you, t you take some young guy or gal, put them in Paris Island, and eight, 12 weeks they come out, they're changed, they're different. Mm -hmm. you know, and they stay that way most of their life. They, mm -hmm. The things that they, and I'm, and I'm sure all the armed forces do that, but they instill something within their character and integrity that's unshakable. Well, what do they say? Once a Marine, always a Marine. Right. You know, once a follower of Christ, always a follower of Christ, at least you should be. Should be. Should be. Yeah, I saw that change in my brother when he went to Paris Island. Yeah. And when he came back. And um, big difference. It, it, it is. And when people come to the Lord Jesus, you should see a, a huge difference. You mm -hmm. should. Oh, yeah. You should. And, Go, uh, going back to what you said before about Jesus being very clear in his language, mm -hmm. um, I like this sentence in here. He wants to be abundantly clear. Following him will be the hardest thing that they will ever have to do. And that's that's hard to picture. Because just think of your own lives and my life. Thinking about the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, and um, this is above all that. Yes, it is. All right, that's one thing when I'm talking to people about the Lord and uh, non-believers specific, and I'll I'll talk about you know to the point of this is the hardest decision you will ever make, and you're going you're going to give up many things to do something like this. You got to make sure that you are willing personally. To step up and say, "I accept this," to go towards Christ yeah. as well. I think I think the decision is easy. I really it's do. The, it's, I, the, it's the commitment. It's the commitment yes. that's hard. Yes, it yes. is. Yeah. It, it's it's one thing to sign your name, you know, metaphorically to the dotted line and say, "Sure, I'll accept. I will accept all these great things that, that Jesus has died to give me. Uh, Jesus has committed to me. Wow, I'm I'm willing to accept that." But am I willing to give him the commitment that he expects from me? That's a different story. And I think that in our evangelization, we have got to be very clear, just like Jesus, uh, that, well, as you said, it's, it's, a, it's a, a tough thing. It's not going to be easy. Because living, you know, we're in the world, but not of the world, but we're still in the world. And there's a gravitational pull of this world on us because we've been immersed in it all right. Sure. I mean, I've, I've known people who come to know the Lord, genuinely speaking, and their life just really fall, falls apart around mm -hmm. them soon afterwards. Right. <laughs> and then they come, they come back to me, and they're like, "What's going on? I, I'm following the Lord. I'm doing these things." I'm like, "You are being attacked. 
you you got this commitment going, mm -hmm. and now you got to push forward. You got to grow your faith even stronger in the Lord. And right. uh, one of the things I read was talking about. I mean, growing in our faith and deepening our walk with Christ is something that requires a whole life, not just the mind. With this, right. and so I mean, so we got to just follow through wholeheartedly in all of our life. Well, it, it, that what you just said. Um, it, it requires our whole life and not just our mind. That sounds like Romans ten nine and ten. Mm -hmm. You know, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, that's in your mind. You, you believe that, and it's something you can confess. Mm -hmm. But believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead is what saves us, because for the, for the Jew, Jewish mindset, the heart was the center of who people were. It's the thing that really drove them to do what they did. That's where the, the, that's where the, the, the seat of belief is, is in your heart. That's right. So you can have it up here, you know, miss heaven by 18 inches. But not having your heart. That's a track I was on for many years. Because uh, I was baptized when I was seven years old. And then when I was 15, I realized, hey, I need Christ in my life. Mm -hmm. I need to ask him to forgive me for my sins. I need to ask him to come into my life. And I knew everything right here. I mean, I grew up in church. <laughs> I was there every time the doors were open since mm -hmm. nine months before I was born. <laughs> right. But the, but the fact of knowing it here and knowing it here is way two different things. And that's why I had to relate my own life as well. Sure. Well, how many how many seminary professors, you know, leave the faith? Uh, I, I can think of one right now uh, from North Carolina. I won't say who he is because I don't want to give him any publicity. But he is a New Testament scholar. He's written a bunch of books, and out of the blue, he just decides, "Hey, I've lost my faith." So this guy's got a PhD. He's obviously got you know his mind filled with facts, but his heart is as black as coal. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's what it takes. Is that, is that change in your heart you know like you said when people come to know Jesus I, I warn people when they accept Christ you have been on the devil's team for a long time you just became a free agent you're on another team now mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're on his radar mm -hmm. now he's saying uh oh I just lost one that's belonged to me since they were born um, I'm gonna go after that person I'm gonna make their life miserable I want to do everything I can to get them they got their hand to the plow I'm going to try to get them to look backwards. You know, look at who you were. People, people know what you did in your life. Who are you trying to fool? You're not a Christian. I heard that for years. And the worst part is, is that it was effective in my life for years. Sure. It was. I thought, goodness gracious, I, I can't go around. I mean, just, just claiming to be a Christian, people are going to think that, you know, that, that's blaspheming in the name of Jesus mm -hmm. because of who I was. But who I really was was a redeemed person who had been washed clean from all that iniquity just didn't understand it. And I think that the American church does a very, very poor job of discipleship. I think there are some churches that are great at evangelism, but the Great Commission doesn't say just simply go out and share the gospel. It tells us to do that, but it says make disciples of all nations. And I think we fall down uh, after the baptism. Hey, you got saved, you came forward, we're going to baptize you, all right, go into a Sunday school class and become a disciple. And that doesn't happen too very often. It just doesn't. And I think that as a, as a whole, uh, you know, indicting the entire American church, I think we've done a very poor job of, and we can't force people to become disciples. We can give them the tools and resources. I think Oak Grove's done a, a pretty good job. I think we have, as a church, done a good job. I'm talking about comprehensively as a nation uh, of churches. I don't know that uh, that we've done the best job. There are some churches don't even have Sunday schools. You know, they come and they they do the entertainment thing on Sundays, and then say, see you guys next week, mm -hmm. and that's it. And uh, they, they don't try to get their people in the Word. Um, some of them don't even stand on the authority of the Word, so you can't have a disciple without that. Yeah. So there's four things that Jesus tells people that they need here. The first is hate. Um, a, a, a such a great love for him that anything in comparison looks to hate. And again, uh, I've even got some some examples here uh, where you know the fifth commandments about honoring your mother and father, which is your first first earthly relationship. Matthew fifteen, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for telling people to give money to the temple, even at the expense of neglecting their parents. So. Um, obviously, that that tithe money, 
um, Jesus is saying that should want to take care of your aging parents mm -hmm. uh, rather than coming here. Um, Matthew 19, somebody asked Jesus um, uh, a question. He said that honoring mother and father is one of the commandments that's necessary to obey for, etern for eternal life. Uh, it's Matthew 19, 16 through 19. And then on the cross, we see Jesus mm -hmm. caring for Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously, we're, we are we are called to uh, take care of our loved ones. The second thing that he tells us to do is to bear our own cross. I don't think we really touched on that a uh, whole lot yet. Uh, but bearing our cross is suffering in the sufferings that Christ suffered in. I think that when we come to Jesus... As Galatians 2.20 says, we don't, we don't live our own lives anymore. We live our lives in his life. And part of his life was humility and suffering. Um, and, and going back to what Trey said, when people get saved, they think that, you know, the Christian life is unicorns and butterflies, and <laughs> far from it. Yeah, the suffering part, I mean, we will never, I don't think, suffer like Jesus suffered. Mm -hmm. no. uh, and the pain that he went through. No. Um, that he didn't have to go through. So our, you know, we have bad days, we have good days. Mm -hmm. And when there's bad days, sometimes it's hard to say, okay, well, this is only temporary or this happens to other people or something like that. It, it's hard to get by through that day sometimes when the things are so difficult. Yeah. And we've all had those days. And I think we have to understand that everybody bears a different cross. You know, it, it, you share the gospel with someone who is a, a Muslim, and they say yes to Jesus. Um, there's ramifications for that. They, sure. they could be killed for that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's their cross. For some people, it's it's remaining sexually pure. That may be their cross. For others, it may be you know your family turns against you, it, you lose your job, whatever. Um, but, but we're to bear those crosses, and we, and they're all different. Mm -hmm. You know, my cross isn't your cross. Right. But it's, it's just hard to do that when it's happening to you. It is. It's very, very difficult. Well, it's, it's, it's easy to prescribe the medication, and it's difficult to swallow the pill. Take, take, a, take a big spoonful of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the third thing Jesus tells them about is counting the cost. And he uses those two illustrations mm -hmm. of a tower and, and going to war. Um, Jesus, uh, because he was crystal clear, he wants us to know up front what being a disciple is going to involve. And I think that our evangelistic techniques, um, again, they, I, don't, I don't think that, that they really outline what people are going to have to forego um, in coming to Christ. Uh, we, we have to look squarely at the cost of following Jesus and then make a, a, a commitment Based upon that knowledge, you know, not just a, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give up my sins and give them to Jesus, and He's gonna forgive me, but I'm gonna give up, perhaps my lifestyle. I'm gonna have to give up my, you know, my my, my preferences. Um, that that's not palatable to people. They, they don't want to do that, and, if, and they say, you know, if you'd have told me that before. Uh, maybe I wouldn't have done it because it's like Jesus said um, people building a tower they don't just start banging nails you know they sit down and do an assessment of what am I going to exchange in order to get this what's the cost of this mm -hmm. um, I think I think the cost of following Jesus is incalculable because he's asking us to give up everything. You know, the, the, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I wish somebody would ask me that. I'd be like, wow, you know, you gotta do this, and you gotta, you gotta that, and, and Jesus all take care to tell us day, you were on the cross, it was finished, and, and Jesus didn't bother doing that. He, he corrected his theology, and he told him to, he, he looked into his heart and told him that one thing that he knew he was going to struggle with. He knew what that cross was. And it was the fact that he had much. Mm -hmm. And he went away sad. But he, but he, counted, the, he counted the cost, mm -hmm. and he wasn't willing to make the commitment. I once, I once heard someone say, count the cost, 
Be ready to pay for the cost, then take up your cross. That's a good way to put it. I saw watch on a show yesterday in Alaska. They were building one of these cabins out in the middle of nowhere, and they had to transport the equipment with a big snow plow and other snow equipment to get it up the steep hill. And they started building his house, and they were, they were doing it in seven days. And so they had everything calculated out as far as what they needed. And they get up there, and they start putting this thing together. And then they said, oh, no, we're 35 boards short <laughs> of a certain board or something like that. And it wasn't just a matter of making a phone call and getting it delivered or something like that. It was a big ordeal to get other well, stuff. It cost some time. And oh, yeah. And um, but they did. They, they I mean, there there were mud trails they had to go through. They would constantly get stuck, even these big pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. But they were able to get this house done in time. But they, the point is, they planned this, and they had it calculated out. But they came up short anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think some people do that too. They say, okay, yeah, I can do that. I can um, give up this, give up that. Um, but then when it comes to the point of actually doing it, I think it's where some people fall down. Mm -hmm. They can't carry through. They, they, well, I didn't really think it was going to be that much or that big or right. that hard. Um, and, and then they, that's the point. I think they, they start losing faith and losing sight on him. Um, yeah, and, I, and I think my, much of that may come because people don't realize who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Really, I, I believe that. I mean, I think the point of all this is not to count the cost and walk away because the cost is too much. I think it is to count the cost and embrace Jesus because he's worth it. Mm -hmm. That's that's just how I, what I take away from all this. Sure. Jesus is worth it. It's worth it to give up everything. That was, that was the, the fourth point was to renounce everything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our desires, our lives, our possessions. Uh, Jesus wants to have a hold on us. And he wants us to have a hold of him to the point that you know we, we have a closed hand where nothing else is going to use, you know, knock him out of that spot, knock him off the throne of our hearts. And you know, we're, we're, we're too, we are too tempted and we're too likely to allow that to happen. Yeah, I looked up that word renounce um, and found another word for forsake. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, because look at the word renounce, and somebody might read that and say, yeah, I don't really quite understand what that means, but for sake, to give it up um, as if you didn't need it. Right. That, that's the big thing, as if you didn't need it, because mm -hmm. a lot of things we have we don't really need. Um, Amen. But um, for sake, I, I like that word in there. We become like ruined salt. Yeah, how can it be made salty again? And when you think about Job and what he went through, and that wasn't his doing; mm -hmm. um, it was the devil. And but he took everything away from him, and God God allowed it up to a certain point of taking his life. Um, but Job, you know, we talk about discipleship and. Faith, Job didn't. I'm Job did not give up. He he kept that. Um. I think Job understood uh, a principle that we sometimes struggle with, and that is that everything that we have is a blessing from God. It's all on loan. Mm -hmm. It's all just a loan to us. Our children, our health, our wealth, everything that we have is given to us by a good, loving God. And when God decides to remove those things from our possession, uh, as Job said, you know, though he slay me, yet shall I live. Mm. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And to praise in the midst of pain and suffering and loss. It's hard. That's taking up your cross. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's evaluating uh, what you're getting in return for what you've, you've lost. And recognizing who's in charge, mm. All right? And uh, the hard part with that is it's hard to answer the question when somebody says, "Why 
is God allowing this to happen to me? Mm-hmm. And, and we all heard that for mm-hmm. different reasons. And um, it's hard to tell somebody when they're going through a difficult time. You know, that other than, you, you know, and we might not have an answer because God's the one who knows that answer. And it's not our job to answer. No, it, yeah. it, it was, it, I mean, God's got that answer. Yeah. Whatever that may be, and we don't know what that is at the time. And some point down the road, you just say, "Oh, that's why." Yeah. We might might see that. Yeah. But when I've I've heard that question a hundred times, and I just tell people the same thing. All I know is that God is good. He's good all the time, and you know all things work together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And we can't see good in every situation at that point in time. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've all suffered, we've all struggled, and we can't see it at that time. If we're if we're blessed, we can eventually see the good coming out of the hardship. Mm-hmm. You know, you see ministries evolve, uh, or Adam ministry evolve because somebody had a chemical addiction, so somebody was an alcoholic, and so Jesus freed them from that that chemical, that alcohol addiction, and they said, we're going to take this horrible event in our lives, this this wound, and we're going to help other people that have the same wound. And I think that's how every ministry starts. God puts that burden on your heart to take uh, the the suffering that you've had and use it for His glory. Mm. Think about when Jesus chose... Um, the 12 disciples you know just come and follow me leave, leave those nets there mm-hmm. leave those fish there leave that boat there um, just come and follow me and they did it yeah, I mean up and rolled they did just think about that if, if right now today if one of us are asked um, <clears throat> can you give up everything you have to come with me when this when this whatever it is it's difficult yeah yeah I think we have preconceived notions that are faulty you know when we think of missionaries I think of guys like Hudson Taylor um, guys that gone around the world you know and had books written about them and they did all these incredible things um, I, I think the the most important missionaries are the ones that are our neighbors that we don't know about you know I talk about my grandfather testament a lot um, he was a very humble, quiet, honest. Well, he wasn't quiet in the pulpit. <laughs> he, he would sh- he would rock the rafters, um, but uh, uh, he never would tell anybody about people he led to Christ. He, you know, he that wasn't a feather in his cap because he would say, I, "I don't save anybody. Jesus saves them. I just give them the opportunity." When he died, he was eighty three when he died, and. The, the viewing at the funeral home was supposed to go from 2 to 4 and 7 to 9. It went from 2 to 10 mm-hmm. because people never stopped coming. And people would come through that line, and I was at the end of the line. I was his grandson, and your grandfather led me to Jesus. You know, I'm a pastor today. I'm a Christian today. I'm saved. Hundreds of people. And uh, you know, I didn't even know in his lifetime he'd done that. But uh, I found out after his death, and I look at him, and I'm like, there's a man who was a missionary. He understood what it was to count the cost. He didn't worry about what these people thought of him, because I'm sure that out of those hundreds that accepted Christ, there were thousands that told him, hey, old man, get out of my face. Right. You shut it. up. You're crazy. I don't want to hear your, your Bible thumping, you know, because I've heard all that stuff. Um, but that's, that's somebody who persevered throughout their lives and, and was dedicated to Jesus. And I'm sure that they're all around us, and we just don't know it. Mm. So when we have that idea that a missionary is somebody that, you know, high and lifted up, that's not true. Mm. You know, we can be like Jesus because we have the Holy Spirit in us. We can go out and we can make disciples. And, and the greatest thing is that he promised, and I will be with you mm. until the end of the age. I mean, goodness, how much, how much more can Jesus do for us? Right. <laughs> so what's our takeaway? Commitment, commitment, commitment. There's a, uh, a recommended 
read here. I don't know if you guys remember the book Not a Fan. Yeah, Kyle Eidelman. Uh, Kyle Eidelman wrote a book uh, called Not a Fan. Gosh, 10, probably, probably 10 years or ago. more years ago. And mm -hmm. I, I think that that book really speaks to this lesson today. Yeah. Um, and I, I recommend that um, as a as an even deeper dive into it's this. More Radical by David Platt. Mm -hmm. That too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's even a, a website, notafan.com, mm. uh, you can look at. But, uh, Great. I guess the takeaway is the cost is commitment. Commitment is high, but the outcome is very high. Right. Amen. I mean, the, what's going to happen? Yeah. yeah, I mean it's not a it's not an easy task. But it's a task that we've been called to do, mm -hmm. and if we've been called to do it, Jesus is going to get us through it. That's right. I, I think that when we come to Jesus, we come without parenthetical conditions. We don't ask for a prenup. We don't say but. <laughs> yeah, there's no but. Mm -hmm. It's just yes, Jesus, and and that should not only help us in uh, in our own lives but also in our evangelistic efforts we need to remember when we tell people be crystal clear with them um, this this is not the end right. this is the end of, of part of who you are but it's the beginning of something very different and you're going to experience different things you're going to experience suffering you're going to experience loss because that's who we are in the flesh but it's the most important relationship that you could yeah, ever absolutely. have. And though it could cost us everything that mm -hmm. we have, the cost, like you said, it's incalculable mm -hmm. uh, what the cost is. It's 100% worth it Amen. Um, in the end. Amen. Trey, you want to pray us out? Sure. Father God, we come to you today. It's thankful to be in your word today, God, just as a as a staff together, God, discussing what you're saying to us specifically, God. And God, we know that we have all made a commitment to you, God. And God, we know it's not an easy task, but it is a task, again, like I said a while ago, that you called us to, and you're going to pull us through it. And God, we just uh, continue to pray for those that are listening to this broadcast right now, Father. God, we pray for those who may not know you in a real and personal way. God, I pray that they may make that, make, they may make that commitment today, mm -hmm. Father, uh, to you. God, for those who are already committed to you, God, we pray that they'll uh, evaluate and reevaluate their commitment to you, God, and that they'll step up the bar even more, Father. And God, that they can uh, truly seek you even more, God, as you call them to, uh, to, uh, to follow you in an even deeper way. But God, we ask you to guide us in all things we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.